setting a timer, because I do fail at timekeeping in <laughs> talks. Um, talk about failure. I still don't know why you asked me, Flynn, but okay. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, oh, and you put oh, that there. You. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, there's a fail on there where someone really, one, my team did this and they abused me with post-its. There's one in there that's really inappropriate. Um, <laughs> All right, so oh, that was you as well? Okay, okay. All right, so um, when I put this together, I was thinking uh, work-life failures because as a designer, our kind of lives merge and they're pretty much kind of entwined so that the failures happen at home and at work and more often than not, it's just kind of this massive combination. Um, I thought I'd kick it off with just kind of set the mood. So it was our favorite video a couple of weeks ago in the office. Um, so, uh, <laughs> all right. So ultimately, failure is about um, not meeting your expectations or the expectations of others. Um, that's what Joe told me. Um, and I kind of, it, it is true that you know, we're, we're forever disappointing ourselves. We're forever dis disappointing others. Um, so I guess my first point, uh, I've kind of done it into work and life, um, and I've kind of got about 20 odd points. Um, failure as a living, I think that's the career that we're in, especially me as a creative. Um, it's quite tough and you get used to it and you have to, you know, we're constantly getting disappointed by decisions being made by others. Um, we're constantly having to fail. Um, I guess my job as a creative director is I have to encourage failure from everyone I work with so that they get to a better result, but equally I have to mitigate failure for our clients. So it's a really weird balance where you're constantly kind of trying to succeed but fail at the same time. Um, and I, I put this slide together a while back for Vivid Pecha Kutcher, which I still think is kind of right. Um, so if we turn up to work, right, we've got, we, we have all these brilliant ideas. And then in the studio, especially in my studio, 90% of those get killed quite quickly because we, you know, you, obviously we all do stuff and then you go, that's rubbish, that's not so good, uh, I didn't quite crack it. And then as, as a collective group, we decide, let's get rid of all the weak stuff. So you get rid of 90%. You hopefully end up with two to three routes that you're kind of really happy with and you're going, ooh, which one is the one that we want to present? Then, um, then divide that by three because one of those routes is going to hopefully get chosen by the client if you present three, if you just go with one, whatever. So ultimately, it's about 3.3% success rate for your ideas. I'm no mathematician, so I probably failed there, but <laughs> it, it's, I think that feels about right. I mean, such a small amount of what we actually do goes out. Um, I struggle a lot in life, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I struggle to be a good person. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I'm forever disappointing myself. I'm forever saying the wrong things. I'm forever... Like, I, I, I say stupid stuff to people and I just kind of of, often wish I didn't say it and then I spend weeks afterwards going, oh, why did I say that? Why was I such an idiot? Why was I so rude? Why did I have that opinion? And it, it's, it's a really frustrating place to be that you, but equally it's good because, you know, if I'm aware of all those failures then hopefully I can be a better person and I think that's what failure does. Every time you fail, if you take it as a lesson, you'll hopefully be better at whatever you do. And definitely, 
for me, striving to be a better person is, is definitely a goal that I haven't achieved yet. Um, and I guess there was, I read a book a long time ago, East of Eden by Steinbeck, and there was a, a scene in it, um, scene, it was a book, but um, where there was this great guy and he had a family of like 10 kids and he was, you know, like the Waltons and everyone loved him and he was, he was super nice and he had crap land and, um, but he just helped everyone. And then there was these, like, this real bastard. And at the author, I, I think this is what happens, it's almost like Steinbeck speaks to you as the reader and goes, who would you rather be? Would you rather be this person who um, is rude to people, is mean, is out for their own gains, is, is just not a nice person, and then when, if they die, people are like, Phew, thank God they're gone. Or would, they rather be that, would you rather be that, oh, that person who just gave to other people and really tried to make other people's lives better, even at the expense of their own? And I remember thinking, man, I so want to be that person, not that person. But yeah, I constantly do mistakes and end up on the other side. So I'm, constant, I'm aware, I'm trying to be better. Um, failure to be brave, I guess uh, this courage, courage to fail, that's, that's part of our job. Um, I'm fortunate, this is my life one, because um, I surf, thank God, it gives me a purpose in life. Um, it's, it's something that constantly drives me to find something every day and get up in the mornings. Um, but it's, it's scary, you know, I love that this is me, I'm not showing any really good picture, um, but taken off there, but that happens all the time. Um, I mean, it really does, and it, and it usually feels like this. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what it feels like. Um, oh, I'm gonna, I'll go back. Um, that's what it feels like, and it's, and it's quite tough. Um, but you get up, and you do it again, and then you make it. And um, again, it brings me, like, failures, they hang in my mind, like, all the time. So I was in France uh, for a few years. Um, me and Brad, Brad went surfing, and um, went down in Biarritz, and there was like loads of people, it's kind of like Bondi, but you know, and apparently they were waiting for ages, this perfect wave came along, it was like that last wave, and I thought, right, I'm going for this, and as I was paddling, it kind of reared up, and I went, whoa, I'm not going for that, and then I spent 40 minutes afterwards, struggling to get a wave in amongst all these people, and I was like, oh, if I'd just gone for that wave, I would have been happy, and it was this thing of, if you don't go for it, then you're not going to, you're not even going to remotely succeed, and so, you bet far better to fail multiple times because eventually you'll have something worth it, you know? I still remember missing that wave. Um, oh, um, and then, um, uh, and then uh, you know, I grew up in Scotland, so we used to surf in Scotland. Um, this is my brother and me um, in our six mil wetsuits. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to be a bit brave um, to kind of go out when it's snowing. Um, or stupid, one or the other, you know? Um, but, but that's it, like, e if, there's, if there's an opportunity, no matter how remote or weird or kind of how cold it is, take it because you never know what the payoff is going to be and it's probably going to be better than you expect. Um, so when I was a young designer, <laughs> oh, it's this, like, when I was this, um, when I was a young designer, um, no, actually when I was a young architecture student or graduate, because um, I, I, I studied architecture, and I didn't study design, and I came back to Euro UK from America because I did my third year there, and I decided, actually, I'm gonna do graphic design. Uh, I thought, you know, architectures were quite, uh, students were like, yeah, we can do anything. Um, I got quite into the kind of gratification of presentations and, um, and ideas rather than the long drawn out architecture projects and kind of doing door jams and window kind of things and roof stuff. So, so I tried to get a job and Everyone, just an internship, and everyone said no, 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 through Edinburgh. And um, I went to one, I had two interviews left, and I went and saw one at this company called Tabern, and they were, you know, they were really good. And I went and saw the creative director, and, he, and <coughs> basically he was, just, he was angry when I saw him. He was like, why are you wasting my time? You've got no place in design. What are you doing? I had to go at the receptionist, and then went, do you know what? Here's what you need to do. You need to go back and study design for four years, then you need to get a couple of internships, then you can go work for a few years, and then you can come and see me. Oh. And then I was like... <laughs> so, so, I realized, so I thought, okay, this is, I'm going to be an architecture student, yay! Um, so I thought, okay, I've got one more interview tomorrow. So I called up that morning, I said, hey, I 
don't think I should come to the interview this morning. Um, I'm going to waste your time. And the creative director said, don't be stupid. I've already got it booked out for you. Come along. And I was like, no, really? And he's like, come along. So I went along, walked in the door, and he said, OK, just to be clear, we don't have any space for interns. OK, but I'll take a look at you for your work. At the end of the meeting, he's like, OK, so internship. Uh, this is when, when do you want to start in two weeks. Here's a number. Call this. Here's a list of people I want you to call. Two days later, I called that number. Another creative director picked up and said, hey, Jason, been waiting for your call. When do you want to start? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? And then I went there for a week's internship. And then at the end of the week, called down to the, or two weeks internship, after, at the end of the first week, called down to the MD's office with the two creative directors. And they went, OK, don't know what you're doing this week. But everyone has come to us in this, in this week and said, we need to hire you. So we're going to give you, if you want, we don't want you to go back to architecture. We want you to give you an apprenticeship, good old fashioned apprenticeship. Now, the, the setting was that my creative director, that creative director, his brother was the uh, creative director of Wolf Hollands and did the 2012 Olympics and all that. So this, but before he did that, he didn't study design either. So he was going, OK, my brother-in-law studied, is like top, top, top uh, creative director. He didn't study. I think you can do that. So they gave me an opportunity. And um, I guess, so all those failures, you know, it, it was so close to not doing it. And then at that last minute, it succeeded. And so I guess, um, you know, accept the failures because something's going to come out of it at some point. Um, <coughs> failure to create the right conditions. I guess um, a work thing. My job is to create the best conditions in which people can fail and succeed. And so it means creating great environments. It means being a nice person. It means, it means encouragement. It means really kind of helping people be the best they can. Um, and so many people get it wrong, and it's, and, it's, and it's a real worry. But, you know, this is definitely something that I put a focus on in my kind of day-to-day, -day, is just how to make sure people can achieve more than they ever thought. Um, which brings me to this point, because do you know what? Having a dog in the office, that makes everything better. And having a dog at home, I'm, I'm desperate to have a dog. <laughs> So I reckon, th I reckon this is the secret to happiness. I've worked in a couple of studios with dogs. And oh, what was the word? Great. What was the word you used? Phasing or something, Sam? Oh, you <laughs> anyway, pa great patching. Anyway, um, so getting a dog. OK, failure to sugarcoat. Um, I think my team knows me for, for being quite blunt. And um, usually what it is is, um, well, here's a bunch of things. We're kind of, I was asking the team what I say. Um, I think uh, these are probably a bit nice. I used to say that shit a lot. Um, but, it, but ultimately, it's, it's, it's not for my gain, it's for their gain. Because I don't want them to waste their time doing shit ideas. And equally, the way I speak to my team is I kind of expect them to agree with me. You know, it's like, in, in a way of, well, you all know that's kind of rubbish, right? Right? <laughs> it's not like I'm trying to be rude. It's just I think we all get it, surely. And, and a lot of the time... What, what, <laughs> what, what happens, I think, is we all get, as designers, we get caught up in our own work. We're like, well, I've done it. I spent all this time, so it must be good. And we, we forget, we lose the filter that says, I've just wasted my time. That wasn't good. So it's all about helping people get to the right place quicker rather than watching them waste all this time, blow the budget, end up with a crap result, and then we all go, yay, that was worth it. Um, so sometimes uh, I get it a bit wrong and I'm a bit rude or a bit blunt, but then my heart's in the right place. Um, right, guys? Okay. Uh, some of my team are here. Um, okay, failure to settle. Um, very quick. And the City of Melbourne, that was approved. Um, client finally went for it. We were like, yes, success. Um, and then the client said to us, okay, are you sure... It's original. Are you sure that no one else, when we launch this, are you sure that no one's going to have that end? So um, budget was already spent. You know, everyone's like, everyone in our business at Lando is like, it's, uh, it's done, budget's gone, get onto the guidelines, whatever. But I went, okay, let's just have another week or two. Junior and a senior designer, Sam, who originally kind of designed that, that logo, let's have those two um, and me just explore. Make sure every M is gone and let's do this. Um, and then that led to that. But we hadn't shown the client yet. Right? So that was a really daring leap. And then but we, we, when we presented it and went, oh, you know that logo that you signed off? 
it's actually, this is the identity now, and this is how it works, and so then we sold it with a movie and all that. And then they went, oh, okay, great, are you sure? I mean, it's pretty scary for them. But the, the biggest thing, I, I guess, about it, that pushing it, we wouldn't have got there if we hadn't had that extra time, or we hadn't gone, it's good but not great. <coughs> but then one of my biggest failings in my career, I guess, is I, I fail to ask people for their opinion, or not their opinion, their approval. So, um, as in, if you're going to submit to a creative awards, if you ask the client to sign off on those awards, they tend to check, tell you, you can't put that image, change that writing, it needs to be more business focused or whatever. And before you know it, you've got a really bland entry that doesn't win and then no surprises. Clients like, oh. Whereas if you, if you win, you just tell the client, hey, you won and they're, they're happy. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't check. <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't check with people too often, and it does get me into trouble. Um, when City of Melbourne launched, this was, um, this was what went out. So even though the client had approved everything, um, and about two days before the launch, they got a bit of cold feet and said, actually, we're just going to release the one favorite logo. And then they changed the colors themselves, and then their internal team did, um, did the brochure. Now, it, you know, it, it was good in the time. It was all very fast. Um, but suddenly... It was, being in the, it was in the press getting, you know, it was on TV, expensive brand. It can be sold to Wollongong if Melbourne don't like it in a few years. Um, <laughs> just turn it round. That's, what, that's actually what happened. Um, the tweets were abusive. Everyone, you know, Australian design industry in Melbourne um, signed a petition to get rid of it. Um, oh. Melbourne magazines, it said, I, I've cut it off, but it says, oh, my God, what the fuck, using the, the logo. Basically, everyone hated it. And... Um, and we weren't allowed to say anything for two weeks. And then finally, like, the team were like, no, oh, we thought this was so good. And basically, everyone tells us we're rubbish. Mm, fail. Um, and then eventually, I just went, do you know what? Let's just put up what, we've, what they've approved and what's ready. Let's just put it on our blog. And we did it. And then suddenly, the conversation changed. And everything that we designed all went out. And everyone started talking more international than local, because Melbourne was still pissed off that it was designed in Sydney. <laughs> um, so. Um, so anyway, uh, the conversation changed, and then that led to a whole lot of trouble. You know, letters from the lawyers, from, from the client, um, like repeated issues. Um, but ultimately, the long-term effect of it was kind of that it worked out. Um, and, and then a couple of years later, they, you know, they, they, they have used all the different variations, and they're really pushing it. And it's great, but it, they were afraid at that big kind of what they didn't know. Failure to understand culture. I need to move on. Right. Um, what am I going to talk about? Oh, yeah. So, worked in Paris, okay? Um, brilliant experience. The, the beautiful life. What I didn't realize when I moved to Paris was um, a word of advice from an American uh, strategist that I worked with who said, you don't move to Paris for a career. You move there for, a li for life, as in for a good life. And here was me, straight off the back of Melbourne, like ambitious. I'd been working with some really amazing creatives. And I got there... And I was, I was hungry, hungry to kind of make a difference and kind of, I, I kind of in, spoke to all the team. It was like an 80-person office. And a lot of the designers didn't really believe in design. They kind of felt like their job was just churning out rub rubbish packaging. Their client service had a big role, so like they were being briefed directly by client service. So the, the design directors didn't really have too much control of the creative output. It was very much a client service-led approach. There were a couple of really great people and gems, and I mean, the, the culture was awesome and people were brilliant, but it, I, I wanted to try and, I was too keen to kind of put my stamp of authority in how to do things versus understand the culture and how they did things. Um, and, um, you know, like Paris is very different. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much that I, I got to love by the end, the Vélib, the bikes, you know, I hated the French breakfast, so glad to come back to Australian breakfast. Um, <laughs> The, the, the espresso, you know, them, those many years without uh, milk in your coffee was great. Um, but, and it, like, Paris is amazing, and I definitely romanticize it more now. However, the team were brilliant. We had a five-story building. It was great. But the problem was, in those first few weeks, in the first few crits I was in, I basically destroyed people's confidence. I was like, this isn't good. That looks like this. What are you doing? And I was just, I got it so wrong. Back to that earlier point of being a dick. Um, <laughs> I got it so wrong, and I spent the next two years trying to recover from that by trying to build confidence with people and trying to 
to help them rather than criticize. And it was, it was such, a, such a critical thing that I just misjudged that I just assumed that everyone else was, um, uh, had the same kind of ambitions or in, intentions with the work. And it, and it wasn't true. And actually, it did take two years. And, and you know, again, like Jo over there, she, she worked there. And, um, and there were some brilliant people. Don't get me wrong, there some really, really great people. And, uh, and I love most, most of the team there. Like, I, I still want to see them whenever I go over. And they're great. But it was just that misunderstanding of how I should have tackled it. Because it could have been a, so much a more a kind of dramatic change if I'd just done it correctly rather than you know, mess up at the beginning and then try and get it right. Um, I blame this on France, though, failure to be on time, <laughs> because they go to bed incredibly late, and then they get to work uh, late, and then, you know, it's like 10 at 9.30, then there's coffees, and then there's, uh, like, cigarettes, and everything's late, and two-hour lunch breaks, and uh, I always had a problem with that. I was like, we start at 9. Um, <laughs> again, kind of misjudging the culture. And, um, yeah, anyway, so I'm always late, and it disappoints the hell out of me. I can't imagine what it does to others. But, it dis but I always feel like I'm letting people down, because I am. Um, oh, yeah, failure to, be the to meet the shake. So I've got a project here I thought was quite good. So we were, at the beginning of this year, we were working on the Dubai identity, which was an amazing opportunity. Um, and we did this, uh, like, one of my favorite pieces of work of all time. And um, it was so good, and Kat was the lead designer on it um, just there. And it, it was so great, and Ryan over there. Um, and it was brilliant, and I loved it. I've got a video. It's going to take up a minute, so I can shut up for a second. Um. So it was set on about Dubai, anything is possible, because let's face it, I mean, that city's emerged from nothing, from a desert, you know. How many years, Ryan? 15, was it? Yeah. 15 years from desert to that, to a massive city, and amazing architecture and brilliant stuff. And so it was about Dubai inspires, and, and you know, the sun, it's all based on the kind of sunrises and the temperature and all that. Um, and we got that, and it, it was like, yeah, we're working through it. We were working with, Lon with MNC London, and it was going through and going through, and... Um, and then it went, oh, actually, can we just reduce some of the gradients? Okay, we're going through a gradient phase then, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then can we do this? And can you just simplify it? And can you simplify it? And, and it got round after round after round without dealing with the shake, but his marketing team, to the point that when it finally got so boringly generic that they went, ah, oh, it's no longer as impressive as what you'd originally done, so we're not going to do it. And that video never got finished because that was for the shake. And it was, so it's kind of, that's why it's a bit disjointed. But it, it, the, even the way they do it, right, the whole point was 
we would produce the video and all the layouts and it would be laid out in a room and then the shake would go with you wouldn't even be allowed to go there he would go with his team and he'd walk through and go yep no so no explanation no nothing other than from them so the video had to do all that so you know it's really hard to get great work happening anyway it didn't go ahead wasted sad best portfolio piece of cat ever um, so anyway s sadness um, all right um, failure of judgment I can't even remember what what I've got oh yeah this is a great we've all seen this I think um, uh, one of the things <laughs> <laughs> um, so, sorry, I'm going to stop it. Um, so, one of the things, um, oh, look, it's my time. So, I said I've got five more minutes, right? Five more minutes. Are you cool with that? Five more minutes, right? I'm going to just set it because, go! Okay. So, um, so, one of the things I'm really bad at is uh, I'm really good at judging young talent and being able to go, these guys are going to be amazing, and then providing a lot of talent. I think I'm really good at that because the people I've worked with who are, 10 times better than me, and they go on to do way better things. They all started quite young working with me, so I reckon they were just really good, and I was lucky, but I know who that I'm able to find them. The other thing I'm not good at is trying to un, um, pick senior people. And the amount of times I'm like, oh my, I come home to Joe quite a bit, because she's my girlfriend, and I go, oh my God, this person is amazing. They're so good. They're, they're very, she's like, are you sure? It's like, trust me, this, this person's going to change my life. They're so brilliant to work with. And then two weeks later, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't deal with them. <laughs> uh, uh, or, or I'm immune to it. In Paris, we had um, one such person where I was like, this person's great. And the team were like, no, they're not. They're a horror when you're not around. I was like, no, they're great. You don't know what you're talking about. They're great. And, it was, and it's so easy to get it wrong. With, like, anyway, um, so I misjudge and fail my team because of it. Um, failure to deal with authority. Um, it's true. Um, I think in my Landor, Sydney, when I was creative director there, I had three formal warnings, which is, to, you know, it's like David Brent, you get fired after that. Um, <laughs> two, two formal warnings got forced, and the third one was put in, but then the person who it was done on behalf of kind of said, what are you talking about? We're friends. Why would I put a formal complaint? But that whole, uh, clearly I have a problem with the authority, and it's also, it's because... I want to. I, I want to be free. I want our team to do the best stuff, and I. I don't want to follow the rules of people who have a preconceived notion of what business needs to be and how to do work, and and so I clash because I clash with people who are formulaic or structured or too business oriented and don't understand people and the motivations, and um, and so yeah, it's al it's it's almost got me fired, and it's you know a problem. But, you know, I wouldn't change it because <laughs> fuck authority, no. Um, <laughs> none of you guys can think that, though, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, failure to talk money. Oh, yeah, look, quick one. Designers, we're terrible. We don't know how to charge for ourselves. Um, the amount of times... Um, when I was on seven and a half thousand pounds in the UK as my first job, my friends were on 25,000 pounds. That's how bad designers are. In Paris, um, junior designers were on 10K less than junior client managers. Like designers, we often undersell ourselves. We're like the engine of a lot of most com creative companies. They're called creative companies for a reason. And yet we, we're always afraid of asking for money. We're always like devaluing ourselves. Oh, we do work for free in pitches. Hopefully not, but some people do. Um, we, we undersell, we, you know, the logo lounge, not logo lounge, the logo websites for 99 cents or whatever. Atrocious behavior. We just undersell what we do. Um, you know, I'm so bad with money. I did a freelance job about five years ago um, for about 3K, which was quite, I thought it was quite good for a small job. Anyway, I was so bad. It, it was a great piece of work. I thought, I just didn't know how to invoice. I was so scared about invoicing because I'd always been in full-time jobs. And so, you know, six months went by and I was like, I should really invoice. <laughs> then, then, it, then, then, it, then a year went by and I was like, oh, don't know how to do this. And then two years went by and I went, and I never invoiced them. Because I just, I didn't know how to kind of do it. Anyway, so, 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 so now Joe's put me onto zero. For anyone who runs a small business, zero accounting software. Oh my God, it's changed my life. 
the best thing ever, so get on it. If Zero are watching this one, they should pay me for that. Um, <laughs> failure at driving. I did fail my driving test um, three, two times. I passed on my third. But, you know, I hate driving. I hate under pressure stuff, anyway. Um, it was a bit like this. <laughs> 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 yeah, it sucked. The nerves of passing driving test. Like, ah. Uh, okay. Um, another one, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly move on. Um, Failure to type, right? We would, when we were doing the Optus um, rebrand, we did this. Um, so this is our concept that we got approved. Flintstones kind of type. It was it was awesome, um, and couldn't believe that they'd gone with it. And but obviously, you know, it was a good relationship, and they believed in us. And um, Alex over there was a key designer on this, and and Brad worked on this, and it was um, it was really great. Um, and then when we went to get the typeface done, we commissioned a, a, a world-renowned uh, typographer, like one of the best in the world. He was brilliant, and. Uh, we gave him such open brief because, ah, stop, okay, a few minutes, a few minutes more. <laughs> um, we gave him such an open brief because um, we really believed in him, and, but we, we were so unclear that he came with something that we weren't sure about. And it's a beautiful typeface, it just wasn't right for what we wanted. Um, and then a second attempt led to this. And again, it's a beautiful piece of type, but it wasn't what we were wanted because we had this kind of idea. And it was, you know, Optus launched, it was meant to be a 12-month project, and it ended up being a three-month project, as in, you know what, we're not going to launch in December now, we're going to launch in, in July. Go, 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 go! So everything was up against it. So we ended up having to switch typographer. We had to get paintbrushes out and do it ourselves. And then we, when we worked with this French typographer, Mathieu, who's probably, I'm never going to go to any other typographer again in life. Because this guy is about 28 and he's, he's amazing. And he worked his magic in Paris all the time. And he did this and he did all these versions and really tried to push it. You know, as Alex kind of marking up. Um, and, um, and we ended up with this, and, and he did the other one as well. And it was, it was magical, and it was, it's probably my favorite project I've ever worked on, ever in my career. Like the most enjoyable project with the most, the brilliant client and the most positive vibe in the team. Like it was, ev everyone contributed. However, I always wish, now in hindsight, that we'd managed to convince the client to go a little bit further with the time. <coughs> oh, I'm touching the microphone. But, um, uh, it, it, we're super happy with it, I love it, but I just wish it, we'd managed to go a bit more original in the typeface. Um, anyway, um, but it's cool when it's got multiple glyphs and stuff, it, it's awesome. Um, failure to shut up, <laughs> quite appropriate, right? Um, I can't remember what I was gonna say. And, oh yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, I was, at, I was judging the best awards recently in New Zealand and I, I, I was, the, the, the jury um, chairman said, look, you don't need to be right when you're judging, because there's seven other judges. Like, chill out, you know, you, you don't need to force your opinion. But as a creative director, you always have an opinion. You have an opinion with clients, you have an opinion with your team. Yes, no, yes, no, hey, you need to do this, think about it like that. And so you can't help but kind of dominate. And I had to get a nudge, quite embarrassingly so, from the chairman, uh, from the chairman just going, hey, chill out a bit, dude. Um, <laughs> And I felt so gutted, again, back to that original thing of being a dick. Uh, I, felt, I felt so gutted about, oh, by, by getting it wrong. So I spent the whole time trying to recover from it and doing my best. And actually, and then I was going, you know those pieces that I, I said weren't good enough? Can we reevaluate those tomorrow? Because actually, I think I was wrong and they are good. If I hadn't said anything, they would have got a good gold or something. So let's talk about them. But again, acknowledging your failures and then quickly trying to make up for it. Um, failure to be in charge, it's true. Uh, maybe the boss at work, but at home, <laughs> Joe's the boss of me. And, it, and it's not fair, it's not fair. I don't know, I don't know how it happened that I have to cook all the time and that I have to have that expression. When I'm, and, and oh, um, I'm not even, I don't think I've got time. Look, uh, we, we did Cape Town, we didn't do that. Um, but we did this great piece of work, Kat worked on this as well, and it was a beautiful piece of work. Brad went over to Cape Town to work on it, and it was so close, and it was approved, and we were so happy. And then the people who commissioned it were done for corruption. <laughs> <laughs> so this probably, again, the best piece of work we did in 2013, gone. <laughs> and I always failed to call my mum. Do you know what, that sucks. Because she's in the UK and Scotland, and I al I'm always too busy. But I guess the new thing is, you know, I'm I'm never content. I'm never happy to stand still. I always want to I want to change the world. I want to do great things. I want to 
make the best environment with the best people and do have the freedom to, to create. And so today's actually my last day at RE because I'm setting up a new agency. Um, and it's to avoid any excuses and, and whinging or whatever. I want to I wanna see if I can fail. Because if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, would I be content where I am? Or would I like to try and be like Steve Jobs, set up a business, you know, or Dead Poet Society with my team? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Uh, you'll, you'll, if you, you'd do my captain, my captain. Um, <laughs> uh, no, um, look, I, uh, yeah, so I'm going to set up again, and which is a failure to my team right now because the team that I have is the best team I've ever had in my, in my career. I love them, like family, and I'm walking away from them to set up something new. So there's a failure to them, but, you know, hopefully it will lead to something that isn't, is a success and who knows what will happen there. So that's me. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>